Okay. Good good evening everyone. Good evening. Welcome everyone to our uh, evening lecture in the now very well established uh, faculty series This is Design Sciences um, where we have today two wonderful guests with us um, Hilde Rimoy and Jörg Leser um, who will be talking about very unstable flipping buildings <laughs> yeah I hope it works <laughs> truly flipping uh, but unpredictable so let me briefly introduce you uh, my two guests. Uh, my name is Mario Rink. I'm a professor here at the um, Faculty of Design Sciences in the Department of Architecture and teaching and researching construction and technology in architecture. And I have the honor to welcome Hilde Rimoy, who is a professor at the Technical University in Delft. She is a, an a associate professor working um, in the uh, section of real estate management. And um, at the Department of Management in the Built Environment at the Faculty of Architecture. She graduated from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim and um, worked then at several Dutch architecture firms, um, currently also a visiting professor in Naples at the Federico uh, University. Hilde Remoy is teaching, researching and publishing on sustainable adaptive reuse um, and um, uh, the management of real estate and heritage um, and has published several book chapters, books and articles. We have from the practice Jörg Leser from Cologne, from the uh, architecture office um, uh, Bell uh, Architektur Assoziität. <laughs> Uh, he's an architecture and planning. He studied uh, in Aachen at the RWTH Aachen and at the Bartlett School of Architecture, graduated from Aachen um, before working in offices in New York and Cologne. He's a co-founder and a director of um, the architecture office Bell and held positions in Aachen. Um, was a visiting professor in Wuppertal and is since 2011 uh, a professor of urban context at the Peter Ahrens, uh, sorry, Peter Behrens School, so sorry, Peter Behrens School of Arts in Düsseldorf. Um, so we will be doing basically a kind of a, a, a mixed mesh of three inputs on flip buildings, uh, flipping buildings. I will be giving a very short, broad introduction into the topic, connecting also a bit our perspective from. Uh, our own research unit on adaptability. We'll then give the word to uh, Hilde, who will be taking a helicopter flight with you, looking from the market perspective on uh, real estate and problems and perspectives. And then we are landing, uh, landing solidly <laughs> in the application of architecture, where Jörg will then talk us through some projects and their philosophy on adaptability in their architecture. So. Um, I take now 10 minutes with me and then I ask you back onto the stage. Thanks. So flipping buildings, um, it's an invitation to think about uh, reuse, adaptive reuse um, with the three of us. I, I already introduced us. Flipping buildings as an invitation to think about buildings in general and this heritage that they leave us in cities and all the cities that are surrounding us. It's to do with re-reading spaces, spaces that are left from industrial heritage, from uh, younger heritage, from all times of time layers that the city provides to us today. Uh, to see this, under, to understand it as a fabric of um, the, let's say, all the, the dreams of tomorrow, the things that we want to build upon those existing structures, and to create new spaces, or we like to say, new architectures within old buildings. And of course, it has to do with people. Otherwise, there would be no function for those buildings. There are new uses, new meanings to those spaces, and that's where we have to read them and where we have the chance to reinterpret them. The situation is quite uh, clear. We have, a, uh, we have cities, especially in Europe, very dense uh, cities with many historic layers bustling changing, challenging our world every day. 
So the city is changing and the question is, how do the buildings cope with this? So mostly we decide, and this is a, a market principle, we have a private ownership, we have a cynic evaluation of value that we should definitely reconsider, but how do we actually deal with those things that might not change the way we want them to be, uh, the way we want them to go, and we just knock them down most of the time. The construction industry produces 35% of the waste worldwide, so that's a, a, a kind of smashing st statistics, 50% of, uses 50% of our, all our resources, extracted materials, and causes 39% of the CO2 emissions. So this kind of consumption and waste culture, as we see this here, um, joyfully demonstrated in this video, is a problem. We came up, of course, now also adopted uh, as a policy of the European Union and uh, in many other regions, circularity as a larger strategy. Um, let's go and rethink our way of living, our way of producing materials as a circular economy, everything that we consume is produced from somewhere that comes actually as a resource from pre-existing circles. But what circulates actually when we talk about buildings? And we like to think about those three layers. We talk about how can we rethink the material production and also the material kind of um, reuse, reinterpretation, rearranging materials when we see them as new resources. How do we deal actually with components? Uh, if we can take them out of buildings, how can we uh, understand them to reuse them? Reclaimed materials might have a surprising identity for many of those uses. And of course, uh, that's what we are interested in. Let's keep all the material where it is. Let's try to understand the material as a given set of a site as, as, as uh, a given set of characteristics of a site, and let's see this as a starting point. The idea of adaptability, of adaptive reuse, comes actually from um, a reinterpretation of the very city fabric, all those beautiful and all sometimes also not so beautiful existing buildings, uh, reinventing a new, uh, reinventing a use or reinterpreting a building for a, uh, uh, a new given use, or maybe the same use, but upgrading a building. But we have to change a building uh, for a new function, and we are trying to understand how is the building's capacity to allow this. Uh, our adaptability understanding, how can we actually read the capacity, the properties of a building so that it possibly allows us to use these wonderful capacities, these wonderful qualities, opening up the building, um, maybe um, freeing a potential that has not been there before. Uh, many of those buildings that we are discussing as successful cases ha have actually never been designed to be reused. Or also in the, another way, how can we actually build new buildings, how can we plan interventions that they allow a frictionless or a low friction intervention for new uses. There have been brilliant four thinkers already, often mentioned uh, Stuart Brandt, actually a computer engineer uh, from the Silicon Valley who in his uh, late work also uh, thought about buildings, produced a wonderful uh, BBC series for someone who's interested uh, on YouTube. You can see all those uh, amazing uh, video documentations. A building will always change. We know a building is made for use, uses change, buildings need to change. And Brandt understood this very early and say like how buildings learn is basically they are um, failing or they are allowing this change, embracing this change. We have John Habracke, just to mention many of those, a few of those brilliant thinkers uh, passed away recently, left us a, a huge amount of, of great ideas and uh, uh, kind of intellectual frameworks of how to think about change, something that can be permanent, something that can change within, some ideas about participation, how actually the users have an entry into that idea of a new space. 
um, Brandt with this legacy uh, concept of uh, shearing la layers, that all those parts of a building that we use every day, that we have to build, of course, but that we use every day, they have different lifespans. They have different lives. And those, as he says, should be respecting each other in the planning process, otherwise this building falls apart because those shearing layers basically dismantling each other uh, automatically. So respecting the lifetime, the different lifespans of a building's parts, we have um, 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 also other concepts of redesigning, understanding those different parts of a building and using them for um, a loipe, for example, for uh, a redesign concept of buildings. It's a concept that we call spaces of transition, understanding actually design uh, of a building as a permanent change. How can we actually moderate change as architects, as planners, to allow a continuation of basic principles, of a backbone, and how can we allow different futures of those layers? As we know, uh, Brandt said this uh, fantastically, we are knocking down buildings all the time because simply all buildings are predictions and all predictions are wrong. We cannot plan the unplannable. But what can we then plan is, of course, certain frameworks around this. There have been many ideas. How can we, how can we possibly invent buildings that can do a lot, building like machines, Buckminster Fuller imagined machines that can dismantle, that can be flipped in its very function every day, so the car as a building, the building as a car. We would like to rather also connect the highly influential um, um, British tradition of uh, high-tech architecture in terms of um, the idea of how a building is connected to a city, Archigram, that we do not want to build machines. We do not want to build a city as a machine. But we would like to think that there is not a, a clear border between the building and the city. The building grows and is part of its environment as the environment can only exist because there are these constituents, the building. So there is a growing process back and forth between the building and its environment. And those uh, principles that we try to establish here is porosity and permanences from the very idea um, Richard Sennett uh, describes very nicely the uh, Nolly plan in Rome um, where we have all those public spaces which are highlighted in white here and all those spaces which are private are basically hashed and, and are dark here, non-accessible, others are porose and accessible. We have public places and we have public buildings. They are kind of uh, weaving into each other. But the understanding of a space, a building in a public space, in a public realm of a city, is determined by public spaces, accessible spaces, and not so accessible spaces that is making the porosity of a built environment. And if we project this into a building, then we can see, of course, our city fabric creates permeability. The way we are transcending through our urban spaces that is allowing us access or not, movement, we can actually also transcend through a building. This is what we can create with the porosity taken from Senate's idea of the city, the building as a porous city where we can transcend easily or not so easily in very different ways through our time, through the building, or we can also understand the elements that we create in the building, the walls, the ceilings, as permeable or possibly permeable elements that we can open up and make also permeable as we go. We try to study many of those um, cases from conversions to understand what can we learn from them? What can we learn from existing buildings from conversions in the way they are allowing a better dealing with friction that every building has? How can we design buildings, intervene in buildings to actually create less friction for, for future use? And that's, a, I believe, a very powerful concept. 
Um, there's actually Frank Duffy who said, buildings aren't made of glass, concrete, and stone. They are made of layers, layers of time. When we think and take back this concept of Brandt and say, like, our buildings are made of those layers. So there are things are wearing off much easily. We are changing floor plans every 20 years or so, the technology within the building, the facade every 40 years or so. The site, he says, is forever. And then the structure is the backbone of a building and can stay there for 100, 200, often it's pro projected as 200 years. Why can we not start here and imagine the structure as part of the site? This, the structure as the very energy intensive part of a construction site that is the given site as a space to be appropriated. The ruin as a starting point, as a state of becoming, like this wonderful photography series from Amélie Labourdet, uh, understanding those ruins not as a failure, but as a start, uh, uh, a new beginning, a new identity, a new life cycle. And as we look at also buildings in our city fabric, to remove the infills, to understand the friction, those layers which are easy and inviting us to change them, others they are less inviting and then we leave them ideally, to arrange new corridors where they have not been before and vice versa, to arrange new ideas of space within a given structure to create different buildings um, uh, with which allow uh, various forms of architecture as it has also been picked up by several um, offices in Belgium, 20, uh, one, uh, 51 and 4E, creating also even the load-bearing structure with different permanences on and all the layers uh, alike. What does it mean, designing path uh, pathways of change? We try to also embed this in our studio uh, here in, in the architecture department inviting our students to think about those different layers of permanence, understanding, reinterpreting those backbones within the building and rearranging the infill. What is the long lasting definition of the architect that does this intervention? What is the inviting gesture for following architects to intervene in a building? Some subtle layers against some very obvious layers. The uh, ruin that everyone loves and everybody hopefully wants to keep and that building uh, that following generations of architects and users embrace as their new space going through variations of uh, possible lives imagining possible lives in uh, the ruin that you are designing and also the spaces that have uh, a certain quality in different uh, different uh, uses and different lifespans as you go and imagine new generations of people living there. And I think that's a bit uh, the lesson that we learned. We should not uh, forget that we actually uh, are building the lovable ruins of tomorrow. Every building that we are uh, building that are, is, will be at a certain time in the end of their own lifespan and we should actually seek for a lovable ruin. And I would like to end this introduction with this wonderful quote of Bob van Reet. A building is a possibility, is conducive, prefer preferably taciturn, silent, is willing, liberate space, mediates, building as intelligent ruins, suitable for use, fit for purpose, as Charles Vosé expressed it, good buildings hide daily use. They are stable, stubborn, obstinately distributive and, following Kant, purposive without a purpose. Therein lies the quality of their durability, of their cultural durability, which yields dignity. Expediency asks for the right scale and utmost precision that leaves everything open that cannot be predicted. Thank you very much. Then I will ask Hilde Remoy to come and take over.
Yeah, good evening. Um, I'm uh, happy to be here and talk about this topic um, on uh, flipping buildings but adopting adaptability. And the subtitle here, Reality Frameworks uh, for Adaptive Reuse, um, is actually something that comes from uh, when I was graduating as, a, as an architect and worked for a couple of years as an architect as well. Uh, and I found we were constantly searching for these reality frameworks, so how to make designs possible uh, that we were making. I'm going to try this. Yeah, it works. Um, so with that, uh, I'll start with the rationale, well, what very often is the rationale for uh, starting uh, building adaptation, which is obsolescence and vacancy uh, of the current buildings. Um, then going on to uh, current developments, something about permanent temporary adaptive reuse, uh, values uh, and examples, cases from practice, um, moving towards a framework. Uh, but first, a uh, definition of adaptive reuse. And, and today I, I um, put the definition that I made in my own uh, PhD thesis in 2010 that any intervention to adjust, reuse, upgrade or transform a building to suit new conditions or requirements of its current or new use. So that is something that includes not only changing the building, but also changing uh, the way that the building is used. Um, obsolescence and vacancy. Uh, when looking at this topic, um, and if you look around you in the city, you will see uh, vacancy, obsolescence uh, coming up everywhere. So it's offices, it's retail, uh, cultural heritage buildings, uh, a lot of different types uh, of buildings. I will focus on offices for this part because that's also where I did a big part of my research uh, on offices in the Netherlands. Uh, and these are some of the uh, pictures that we became very familiar with throughout the last uh, two decades, vacant offices. And uh, what's the reason for, for all these vacant offices, you could ask? Well, um, if we look at the market, uh, you have this continuous drive for new buildings. So even uh, the drive for sustainability. Uh, which gives us this kind of appetite for having buildings that say, I'm green, I'm sustainable, uh, and having this type of uh, uh, developments. But there is also um, technological change. So you know this picture probably, and the quote, uh, what used to fit in an office now fits in your pocket. Uh, which says that we just need much less space than we used to need uh, to do the same things. And next to that, well, maybe partly technological, but partly also uh, changes in culture. Um, this is how uh, people used to work in offices, maybe in the 50s and 60s. It's so a long rows of people, um, someone controlling them. But this is more like what work looks like now. So uh, we tend to call it new ways of working, but it's been called like that for the last 20 years as well. And it keeps changing, it keeps evolving. Um, but it's about efficient space use. We need less square meters. Um, people work at flex desks, hot desks, working from home. Uh, needing higher quality workspaces, and so on. And with that, uh, we create this surplus of offices. Um, and what we looked at as well is then, if we, if we have this surplus of offices, can we then say something about which offices will become vacant? Uh, what are the offices that typically are left behind? Um, so defining characteristics of those to try to understand, uh, try to understand the typology of, of these buildings is something 
uh, that I have been working on. So we look at, on the one hand, deteriorating locations and buildings, uh, but on the other hand also uh, what I just mentioned about uh, changing needs, changing uh, preferences of the users. And then if you know that and you know what the dynamics of uh, building stock is, um, then it helps you to understand what's, uh, what's happening. Because if we look at the, the typical uh, building stock, I think I know the most about the Netherlands, but uh, also in Europe, uh, the same things are happening. Uh, and 1% uh, of the building stock is added each year. So that's a, a very small portion of new build that is added to the existing building stock. And at the same time, we know that the current building stock that we have is big enough. So if we look at it just quantitatively, we have enough square meters uh, for the next 80 years. Um, so that means that we um, will have to start thinking about this building stock and how to deal with it. And then what is uh, the current stock? Um, highlighted the uh, points that are actually about buildings. So there is, of course, a lot of infrastructure, roads, uh, and so on. But if we look at residential uh, building stock, it's about, in the, the Netherlands, it says NL here, uh, we have about 7 million units of housing. And we have something about 1.5 million of non-residential units. This one, Mario already showed, more or less. Um, so we know that we also have a big uh, amount of um, uh, tons of mineral waste uh, and metal waste, wood waste, concrete waste coming out uh, of this building stock once we start to do something with it, but also what we do when we create these kind of buildings. So. Coming from that, adaptive reuse is um, quite a logical thing to think about. So we have this very slow dynamics of the existing uh, building stock. Uh, so adaptive reuse um, is in that sense one of the ways to deal with it and one of the ways as well to make sure that we can uh, reuse our existing buildings um, and work on that further. Showing just some examples that I will not go further into in this uh, presentation, but these are all buildings that have been uh, converted into housing. Um, different types of housing from different types of buildings. So uh, going from the typical office buildings, uh, uh, top left that became uh, rather luxurious housing, uh, going to uh, more uh, mid-rent uh, housing, uh, student housing, a lot of different types of uh, units are organized inside existing buildings. Um, and they were all permanent. This is a project that we're now working on, uh, where we also work at trying to find out what are the opportunities for uh, temporary uses? So how can we have temporary uses in the existing stock uh, that can contribute to value development, that can contribute to new initiatives in the city? And when I say value development, I don't only mean uh, financial value, but also societal value. So what can you uh, organize? What kind of initiatives uh, could have a positive influence on the city. And it's something we just started actually, so we don't know how this will go. Um, but we're doing some case studies in uh, Rotterdam, Vlaardingen, uh, and also one in uh, Belgium, Brussels. Um, it's called Comuna, this initiative. Uh, and they are working in two very different ways. 
so the one in uh, in the Netherlands, Rotterdam, is a very bottom-up initiative um, that works with artists, students, immigrants uh, to try to develop uh, places uh, where um, social interaction can uh, uh, can can happen, and with that they can also create more value for the neighborhood, uh, but also. Um, uh, create good places for people to be. In Comuna, in uh, Brussels, is a bit more top-down. So they got an assignment to do something with vacant buildings and also to create uh, the social interaction between different uh, groups. But both of them are quite interesting and we will do a more longitudinal study also on how uh, they create social value and how they create value in the uh, built environment. Um, what we learn from uh, doing case studies, both on the uh, what we think of as permanent and what we think of as temporary reuses, um, are these opportunities and success factors. So what did we find in the case studies that we did uh, that made them seen as successful for uh, the owners, for the users. Um, and you see very often it's about things like increasing vibrancy, adding social values, um, financial value also, not only to the owner but also to the neighborhood. Um, it's about preservation of heritage. Uh, through using them also creating better maintenance of the buildings. Um, but it's also about short procedures, so how to deal with municipalities, how to deal with uh, uh, laws and regulations, um, how to use this to have lower uh, development costs um, and quick response to uh, people who need a space, people who want a space to do something with. Um, it's about temporary experiments that I was just showing possibilities to try out new concepts that also somehow creates a kind of um, uh, diversity uh, in urban uh, areas. And it's about giving the opportunity for innovative designs. Um, so not only going to the, 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 the quick uh, solutions, but trying to find solutions for the more difficult properties as well. And extension of the useful lifespan, of course. But with all these uh, topics, working towards uh, contributing to an increased urban resilience. And I think that's something that we see in most of these uh, projects, that uh, they are contributing to the development of the city in a different way uh, than when you would have the larger layouts um, on the outskirts or outside the city. Um, the process is also a very important factor in, in uh, developing these uh, adaptive reuse projects. So not only looking at what the building is, uh, but also how do you approach uh, a building to adapt. And then it's about very soft skills sometimes, like finding political support, um, involving a construction team early. So not only the architect, but also uh, builders. Um, it's a sometimes about finding innovative ways of financing, um, because maybe in some of these projects, banks would say, I don't believe in this, this is not feasible. Um, how are you going to, uh, to add student housing temporarily in, uh, in an old uh, factory? Um, and then in many cases you will see that the financers were maybe not banks, but maybe they were uh, smaller companies that know something about the construction industry and who were able to contribute in this way. Sometimes it's also about involving the end users early, so to have participatory solutions where end users are actually uh, co-financers, cooperating, co-creating. Um, it 
it's about trusting the expertise of others as well, because that's something that you do when you start to co-create. Uh, you give some of the responsibility to someone else, which can be can feel a bit threatening, maybe both to architects and to developers. Uh, and it's about keeping the ambition level. So uh, knowing that you have an ambition and how do you keep that one uh, while going through a process like this. Um, what we use in education when uh, talking about adaptive reuse uh, to students is uh, very often frameworks like this. Um, it's called the higher, highest and best use approach. Uh, it was originally intended as being very financial. So the highest and best use would be something that is the uh, financially best option. Um, it has five steps starting with looking at the market demand and, and value of a property with the new function. Um, looking at legal criteria, is this new uh, use, is it feasible? For that, you also need to look at the technical and functional criteria uh, and the financial feasibility before finally, let's say you might have many different uh, options, many, many different variants to choose from, and you choose the one that you call the highest and best option. Uh, but the highest and best doesn't have to be uh, the financially best solution. Very often, uh, you will also see if you start studying adaptive reuse, uh, that it's the option that is financially feasible uh, but after that, it could be the option that is societally the most interesting uh, or that is uh, the most interesting if you look at sustain sustainability or environmental aspects. Um, I brought three small cases that show uh, these three different values, as we call them. Uh, so the first one uh, is a small area development in Amsterdam called the Keuvel. It used to be a shipyard, uh, which means pollution. So uh, the, the, the land was polluted. It closed down in 2000 uh, and there was um, a competition, an architecture competition around 2012. And the winner of this said, we'll uh, be sustainable, we make a sustainable creative hub, circular, with uh, everything floating or everything built on piers. And building it on piers or floating was as to not touch the ground too much, because that was polluted. Um, and at the same time, try to clean the soil using uh, natural interventions. Um, and seeing it also as a temporary use for 10 years. Um, so they're running until 2024. Um, and I should give you an update on this. I will send that to uh, Mario afterwards. Um, so circularity is also uh, something that we're, we're working on trying to understand uh, based on this kind of case studies, but also based on, on uh, theory and trying to define it. So how can we make it, how can we operationalize it and uh, also apply it to, uh, to buildings, to developments? Uh, and here, uh, with a PhD candidate, um, we looked at uh, uh, finding determinants uh, for circular building adaptation. Uh, and they relate very much to these topics that you uh, come back to also, uh, probably when looking at adaptability. So it's a mix of looking at adaptability on the one hand side and circularity on the other. Uh, and bringing these two together, well adaptability is of course also uh, in that sense circular, you could say. Uh, but circularity also has these topics in it 
about uh, material reversibility, uh, resource recovery, and building uh, maintenance uh, on a high scale. So with that, uh, we developed these 10 uh, determinants that we would uh, then also apply and see if we can, based on these, manage to also give directions for new adaptations. Um, societal value. Uh, I show a, a project from uh, Rotterdam. Schrieblock. Uh, it's coming back, right? And this one uh, is also a project that has been, a building that has been around. It was meant to be temporary as well, but it's been around now since uh, 2002, <laughs> although always changing. Um, and it started as uh, a building being squatted by architects uh, when the building was left empty by its corporate user. Uh, and they stay there first, partly living there, partly having their offices there, uh, but also developing it into becoming um, more or less like, like a multi-tenant building um, with very low rents. Uh, that made it a very interesting hub uh, because with rents that were as low as 11 euros per year, um, young startups could find a place there um, and could start to, well, have their companies and they could have quite a big impact on things that were going on. Uh, organizing events, uh, having a real creative hub. Um, and we looked at this case and, and also three other cases um, to see what kind of, of uh, impact do they actually have on the city. Um, and we looked at indicators like the size of the building block, density, street patterns, um, age and state of the building, uh, and also things like th that you come across if, if you would read, uh, if you would... Um, into uh, the names are um, names are dropping out but but if you would go into the literature that says something about urban density uh, and uh, how far away the doors in the street are from each other so how you work with uh, buildings in order to densify the activity on the street okay. and what we found uh, here using uh, using all kinds of data from land use, building information, but also social media to check what kind of events went on, what were the venues, how many visitors did they have. Um, we found that these projects, they somehow have the ability to attract a lot of people uh, and they have the ability to, uh, to really activate uh, the areas around them. And that's something that says something about the social develop, uh, development of the area and about the social value that can be created here. Um, going to the last case, the Hallen in Amsterdam. Well, it looked like this. And it was also um, a building that was, uh, that I look at on the historical and the economic value. Um, it's what it looks like now. It's very vibrant, a lot of things going on. It's been uh, converted into restaurants, workplaces, a lot of different things going on. And we studied here the heritage values first, trying to define heritage values. So what are the heritage values of this building? Um, and what kind of values are they? Can we monetize them was one of the questions that we asked. Uh, and then we found out for some, you can. Uh, so we divided them into what we call uh, emotional experiment, uh, experience, historic and architectural values and decided not to monetize these because they are a different type of values. It's the value of experiencing the building. Uh, but we also found economic value that we said could be um, 
defined as direct, uh, which means market value, locational value, the value of use, um, and indirect and induced values that have influence on uh, the surrounding areas. So what we tested in this project was what kind of influence does it have on the value of properties in the surroundings? Um, it was a building uh, that was, again, it took a very long time uh, before the first initiative to it was, until it was uh, developed. Uh, they had several architects, several developers trying to make something from this building, um, but somehow all of them failed. And the neighborhood was not very keen on having all these developments going on. But in the end, it was actually a, a neighborhood initiative uh, that won, uh, that, that made it. Uh, they hired an architect uh, and they had this development going. So you could also say part of a success of a, such a project might be actually the local initiative uh, and that they were very um, working very much from the values of the local community uh, and how you could realize this. Although in the end it's become quite a commercial, uh, quite a commercial new function. Um, but it, the results showed uh, that actually this project uh, had a very big influence on the uh, prices of housing in the surroundings. So prices were rising with 8%. Uh, and this is including all other, so this is compared to other uh, market prices. Um, which raises a question as well, of course, is that what you want? Um, Everyone seemed to be happy if you say, well, the prices went up 8%, so it's a very successful project. But I think then that's where you need to start the debate. Uh, is this uh, what you want? Um, could you realize this in all parts of the city? Um, and what about other values? So does this come on the cost of other values or does it coexist? Does it also in increase the other values? I think these are some of the these are some of the things that uh, I've been working on uh, and that we are working on uh, right now uh, in this uh, research that we're doing in Delft. Um, building what I call here a reality framework, um, and where we start uh, very much from the building to be assessed. So we always start with the existing building. Um, first, defining its current state. So is it used? Um, is it partially vacant, underused? Maybe it's inappropriate, uh, inappropriate for its current use, meaning it might be in use, but you know uh, it will become vacant because maybe uh, it doesn't fit with current laws and regulations. Um, so you could say, I know that next time uh, they will need rent negotiations, the tenant will leave because you cannot let it out anymore. From the current state, we go to possible interventions. So what could we actually do to this building? Could you reuse it? Could you reuse components and materials? Um, could you uh, uh, adapt it sustainably, maybe partially demolish, modify, adapt? Do you need to extend it maybe in order to make it useful? Um, maintain in a vacant state is also an interesting one because maybe we don't always have the solution. Uh, maybe we have, for example, beautiful churches that are not used anymore. Um, do you need to have a solution right now? Or can I somehow find a way to uh, say, I need a couple of years to decide. Uh, I need to see what's happening here. And then, of course, there is always uh, the opportunity of um, uh, putting a, what we call a SAP field around it, somebody else's problem, uh, which means selling it. That's the easy way. Um, once we decided uh, to 
keep it, not to sell it. We come back to the framework that I showed you first. So uh, using this highest and best use approach, um, deciding what are the possible uh, uses of the building, what are the possible ways to interfere with the building, and then uh, uh, deciding what will be the uh, highest and best use. Um, so with that, I hope I gave you something that is uh, useful for your practice and your studies. Thank you. Okay, and the last input from Jörg, and I think we take the opportunity to get rid of this instable machine here. already been interviewed, uh, introduced uh, by Mario, so um, there's nothing to explain about this slide, but um, I will have an awful lot of slides with me, but I will just stop at exactly 25 minutes and um, see how far I get. Uh, it's easily structured, my lecture, it's typologies, industrial buildings, parking garage, department store, uh, on, and residential buildings. Um, so it's part of what we do at Bell. Uh, we are also involved in urbanism and, and uh, interior architecture. We are an office that is still doing the full range of, of architectural projects. So um, I will start with a industrial building that we realized in Poland. Um, and to connect to uh, Hilde's uh, lecture, uh, I will start with the, the amortization period for this uh, uh, production plant. It's a German company. They went to Poland uh, to produce their goods, um, electrical engineering. And um, the break-even point uh, was uh, 10 years. So the life expectancy of this building was supposed to be 10 years. Um, so it had to be super cheap and um, very flexible. Hmm, maybe not, because in the beginning they thought they, they would just, uh, you know, uh, produce there for 10 years. Um, but we convinced them that um, if this building, first of all, uh, has a sustainable construction technique, it's built out of wood mostly, some of the columns are in steel, um, but if it's adaptable, they might get some extra value out of it, even though they were not expecting it. For them, it was just uh, the surface of their production plant. So we designed a building that is uh, non-figurative, non-picturesque, non-rhetoric, non-narrative, non-referential, an absolute um, uh, circle. And um, of course, there are references in architectural history of projects that we really deeply admire. And uh, this is by Archizum, the No Stop City project. And it deals with an artificially conditioned uh, uh, interior, endless, infinite, uh, flex utmost, flexible to the utmost. And um, for us, this was, let's say, uh, our, our fascination of what could be the ultimate neutral space. So these are the diagrams of the company, how they produce their goods. And by clustering them, um, we, we, uh, it wasn't our intention to create a circle, but uh, it happened. Um, it's a hexagonic, hexagonal system. And actually, it has a lot of advantages because uh, the surface of a uh, uh, sphere or a cylinder, uh, the ratio to the, to the volume is better than a box. And um, we also had to test this building 
uh, regarding to its spans of construction and uh, what kind of grids would fit into it. And so we, we developed this span that would uh, match the hexagonal and the orthogon orthogonal uh, system. And to convince the clients, we um, just uh, sketched uh, the possible uses in this building. And these are, of course, just a few and just for this company. And um, luckily, this was in 2006. Uh, today is 2023. They're still using the building, probably much longer than they intended to use it. Um, and um, this, this space has like the same conditions everywhere. It has skylights and a, a super elegant, I hope you find it elegant, uh, the uh, a super thin uh, structural grid system uh, made out of wood. Um, yes, it looks endless, but it's only 52 meters in diameter. And it has only one window, and this is for the cafeteria. Um, so when once you're in the cafeteria, you look out of this window, and you actually look out of the industrial area. There's this little uh, landscape window where we focused the window on, so you get the illusion you're in the middle of the woods. Um, I'm very happy to uh, present our Belgian project, or Flemish project, here in Flanders. Um, I mean, you, you have to understand uh, the German architectural scene is really admiring Flanders for its ability of ad adaptability, reusing buildings. Um, so we all go here and uh, come back and are depressed in Germany. Um, so we actually managed to win an open oprop all by ourselves. Sometimes we thought maybe there's an, a Belgian office called Bell, and maybe that was just by uh, mistake that they thought, well, yes, the Belgian Bells are winning this, but then it was the German Bells. Um, this project is a, a print print shop, a printing building in the city of Isegem. It's very, it's absolutely in the city center, very close to the market square. A famous uh, print shop, I think Robbe, uh, Strobe used to print everything in Belgium, maps, whatever. And we actually won the competition because we, um, we uh, uh, promised to keep as much of the building substance as possible. Our competitors mostly raised the building. There was little left. And um, so we were happy that um, they believed us that this wonderful building could be reused. Um, it's a double floor building. Um, so where's the, the student with the slaughterhouse? Is, is he here? No. Um, yes, it has some problems because it's dark in the middle. Um, so we needed to um, add a few uh, skylights. And the function of the building was super complex. Uh, um, the, the city archive, uh, a school of theater, music, uh, and arts, um, uh, the city library. Um, and the interesting thing is, the more complex it is, the better it is. You can just, you know, start um, once you 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 proclaim that you can keep the building. You just use all the functions sort of, it's, it's just a furnishing plan, basically, that we developed. So we built those furnishings in uh, as a model and try to stuff as much into that building as possible. Um, it actually only needed a, a very small extension on, uh, on the roof. Um, you, you see that on the top, we just added a little uh, studio up there. And uh, I don't have enough time to go through that super complex uh, um, program. But I will uh, show you. So this is the ground floor. You see blue is the archive. And um, the purple is uh, the library. And the yellow, I'm just uh, giving you a short uh, description of what the yellow is. It was a grand, uh, grand staircase, um, a new entrance, basically 
but it's also the performance space. So it's a, um, a, a hybrid uh, programming of this staircase that also serves as the library stair where you can sit down um, uh, when you read a book. And it actually, it's, it's funny because it, it makes it necessary that we have two entrances. One is the one without performances and the other, then you have a blinking light and it says above the other, above the main entrance on air. So you use the other door and then you can enter the building uh, uh, um, on, on the back of that huge staircase. Um, it's a bit of a sad story because uh, the beginning of the year, uh, the city of Isegem got funding from the state of Flanders to, um, if they build a sustainable building, uh, they get 10 million euro, uh, but they have to demolish the existing building. So we, we couldn't believe it and we protested against it and we said, I mean, this is the, the, the biggest bullshit we ever heard. Um, but it was true, so we are lost, lost the, the, um, the commission. So maybe you want to rally in Isegem, telling them what adaptib adaptibility, adaptability means and that it's the most sustainable uh, um, um, way of uh, dealing with existing buildings. So, um, <sighs> yeah. Um, Jump to Cologne, we won a competition, an urban design competition of um, huge factory halls. Uh, you have to understand that Cologne, when you see the map of Cologne, there's the medieval city of Cologne on the western bank of the River Rhine, and on the eastern bank, it's nothing but, but factories. Uh, nowadays, they're all defunct. The factories have moved away from the city. And this, I mean, it's uh, the, in Cologne, they invented the combustion engine, you know, the, the auto, auto engine. And this is actually part of the KHD, Klöckner Humboldt Deutz company that invented the combustion engine. And just to get an idea of the scale of this hall, you can fit the Cologne Cathedral in there twice in length. Um, we won this uh, urban competition because, um, uh, um, again, we, what is happening now? It's, it's zoo yeah, okay. Um, we were the office that kept the most of the existing buildings. Uh, we transformed one of the large hall into an urban square. And, um, It's blending. I don't know why it's doing this now. Okay, let's then I'll just let it happen. So that this is this is the interior of that hall, 150 meters long, and we uh, envisioned it as a, a, a kind of a public place uh, where uh, there's a museum adjacent to it, a school, uh, ateliers, uh, initi initiatives for migration and inclusive uh, sports. And um, I've never been to Split, but maybe some of you have. Um, in the city center of Split, you will find this strange square. And um, it's an exterior. And as a matter of fact, this used to be the ceremonial hall of Diocletian. So the, the, the city center of Split used to be a building and it was turned into a city. And uh, this was our idea. Um, the problem with Cologne is it's a very old city, 2,000 years old, and things are very slow. So it's six years ago, nothing has happened yet, but we are still optimistic. It's, we haven't been uh, kicked out of the commission yet, but there's still some years to go. Berlin. So I'm switching from industrial buildings to parking garages. Um, we did win this competition also. This is uh, Berlin Neukölln. Um, south eastern part of um, the city center, rather poor neighborhood, but very interesting, very uh, colorful, multicultural, a great place to live nowadays. And uh, but when we won the competition, there was actually an access of 
space in Berlin then. Nowadays, it's completely different. This was 2014, 10 years ago. This was, had no value. And um, they asked us, you know, what can you do with an empty parking lot? And um, so we looked at the building and uh, looked at it very closely because we looked at the construction uh, structure of that building. And it was fabulous because everything was prefab. That means you could remove every little uh, slab of that um, parking garage and uh, create voids by doing this. So we developed a strategy of, of uh, perforating uh, the parking garage in order to introduce housing into it. And um, we did, um, uh, let's say, respect the circulation of the cars. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the next slides. Um, so, wrong order. So, the, 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 this is the courtyards that we introduced into that building. So, all the apartments would face uh, to their own courtyard and be uh, lit well actually. Um, yes, that's the structure, that's the voids, and here, this is what, what I meant, um, so you enter the, the building by walking up this ramp. We actually removed some of the floor slabs to form a loggia at the beginning. We saw that at the Ono project also this uh, um, uh, colonnade. Um, you follow uh, the track of the of the cars, and of course there are no cars allowed there anymore, only bikes. So this is the Colonnade Loggia, the entrance to this housing complex. Um, you have uh, three floors of housing. Um, this is how we envisaged, envisaged, envisaged <laughs> the, the interior, the Rue Interieur, uh, our model. Um, our typologies of apartments, and this is an impression of what it would be like to live in one of these apartments. And what happened? Berlin got expensive and they realized um, there's not enough density in our project. So they, uh, they started another competition. Um, and we were so much in love with our parking garage that our next competition project was really n nasty. And EM2N from Switzerland won and built a beautiful project on that site. But um, so the, the, the actually the conversion of the, of the parking garage was no longer feasible. Very recently, uh, we've been invited um, uh, in a competition for mobility hubs in Oberbillwerder in Hamburg. Oberbillwerder is uh, a, a new town, basically a new huge district of Greenfield planning in uh, Hamburg, uh, won by ADEPT and uh, Karas and Brands. And um, these mobility hubs, uh, they asked, interestingly enough, they wanted one mechanized um, mobility hub and the other one uh, conventional. And they wanted the mechanized one to be transformable. And uh, we thought this might be a glitch in the, in the, in the brief because mechanized parking lots are not that easy to convert, uh, but we tried it anyhow, unfortunately didn't win. Um, so we had these, uh, these revolving, uh, the, 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 the cylinder uh, mechanized parking, and you see up there 2027, full of cars, a transformation into, into a studio and atelier space, still a little parking left, and then here, this would then form into um, uh, um, also an artist space. Um, the axonometry of that, um, there's more to it. Like there's, of course, a lot of sharing in the ground floor. Um, it's, a, it's a wooden construction. So we gave everything, but we did not win. This is the ground floor plan before uh, transformation. And this is like when there are still cars, but um, this is already turned into uh, ateliers. Um, this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, section diagram in time. So 2027 in the middle, 2050 the end. 
Um, the second, the conventional parking garage, um, much easier, they didn't ask to convert this, uh, but is of course much easier to convert, uh, same thing, 2027, 2050, um, the ramp turns into a grand uh, 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 central space with palm trees, of course, and, um, and office space, um, the entire co-working space. Again, the um, section as a diagram. Um, first section, uh, first uh, section we are through. No, second, uh, industrial buildings and parking garage, so department stores. Eschweiler is a city very close to Aachen, um, small city, and our department store um, was actually at the uh, Times Square of Eschweiler, like the, the, the two pedestrian uh, boulevards, and it was built in 1946. Uh, you can tell it's not built by Mendelssohn, but it's heavily influenced by Mendelssohn. Um, and um, when we were asked uh, to work on this building, we were actually only asked to remove a staircase so there would be more rentable space for the retail in the ground floor. And then we told the client, are you, are you sure you want to kind of cut off the three upper floors without any use? And they said, yeah, we couldn't rent them for the last 20 years. No one wanted to be up there. And But we actually... Uh, convinced them to start developing their project. And we said, if we do not, uh, let's, okay, we demolish your staircase, but we build another one. And um, then what is feasible in this location? And it's a, it's a pedestrian 15-minute city. It's a very good location. And we said, this is the perfect um, location for elderly apartments. And we could actually... Um, fascinate the, the owners of, of then developing this building into a building uh, of elderly apartments. And uh, we were lucky. It's, it's, uh, um, it's not a super deep department store. Um, you can have bad luck and it's 50 meters deep, but ours was just roughly 20. And when you look closely at the grid of the columns, you can see it's irregular. And it's only irregular because before the war, the department store was uh, joined out of three different buildings. So there had already been a process of adaptation in this building, and you could only read it in the foundations because the rest was gone after the war. Um, an open plan, a perfect um, uh, uh, support, as Habraken would say, and we were lucky, it's a, it's, an, uh, it's a department store with windows. And this is the new s vertical circulation that we added from uh, the ground floor to the uh, roof terrace for the inhabitants of the building, a um, new elevator. And this is the staircase um, going up. And actually, the handrail uh, was reused from the old... Uh, staircase that we had to demolish. Um, but there was little else, I mean, we, that we could reuse, but we certainly reused uh, the structure. Um, and um, as, a, as an architect, uh, you see we cut holes into the floor slabs, but what is missing? Um, there are no rebars. This, this was built in 1946. Um, so structurally, this was super weak, and, but we had a b wonderful uh, structural engineer. So with some supports of the system, we, could, we are able to cut these holes into the floor slabs and perforate the building so everyone, just as the, um, the parking garage, everyone had their own uh, private courtyard. This is what they look like when you look up. Um, a little bit of a James Turrell art piece, and um, we, we wanted to make sure that not one of them is looking into the courtyard of the other, so there are some sort of pipes going up, and we have, uh, uh, let's say, a plan libre, um, elderly apartments that are lofts. Um, people said, you're crazy, they don't want to live in lofts, but they actually love it. Um, you see the courtyard, and these rooms are 
let's say, neutrally programmed. You can choose where you want to place your bed or um, your dining room. So it's, it's sort of a, a Farnsworth house um, um, layout inside of these lofts. Um, and we have a, grand, uh, a great uh, cluster. One, one floor is a cluster apartment, uh, so it has three courtyards, uh, small units uh, with individual bathrooms and a collective space. Um, and this was actually when um, you see the old lady that moved, the day she moved in, everything was finished within one day. She was an organist, and um, we, this is Bach, uh, of course, and um, we loved the fact that, like, with her anarchic energy, she, she said, oh, no, this is too much, too much light for me in the courtyard. This is where I play, place my shelf. And, um, but I think that's what architecture is about, that it can, you know, is capable of, of dealing with the personal belongings of people from a different generation. So we, we love the interior um, that she created. Um, a new building, super quick, um, International Building Exhibition 2013 in Hamburg. Uh, we competed in the, uh, in the um, category Smart Price. That meant the building was supposed to cost less than 1,000 euro per square meter, which is crazy. Absolutely crazy. I mean, it's 10 years ago, but still it was very, like you would say, an average price back then was 1,800 to 2,000. So 1,000 is really stiff. And um, this is an informal settlement in Cologne. Uh, it's called Heckfahrt. I always take my students there. Um, because these Settlers, this, this was founded right after the war, refugees from Eastern Europe. Um, and this is a garage they built out of scrap material. So it's, it's, it's circularity before circularity was invented. Um, of course, when you build a new building in Germany, uh, there are regulations. And uh, if you want to use circular materials, it's on its way, but 10 years ago, uh, no one was going to give us uh, a, a, a permit for a building made out of scrap material. Uh, anyhow, this is Corbusier's Domino House, the perfect support base. Um, and you know that in the, let's say, in the uh, global south, this is, this is Sao Paulo, this is like the, the dominant building system that you have a base and an infill out of brickwork. Um, this is our uh, competition rendering, and these two migrants in the front are, of course, uh, Peter and Alison Smithson. Um, the idea is, I mean, it's of course because of the 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 the, the pressure uh, to create a super cheap building, we could not. Um, experiment with uh, geometry as in the Öko House or, um, you know, the, this, I mean, the Öko House is probably three times as expensive as this building. And I went, once had a, um, a lecture together with, with Hermann Herzberger and he has this Diagon uh, project and he just hated our project because it, he said, you know, there are no voids, there, there's no architectural space. But I said, it's, yes, it's a thousand euro per square meter. So the idea is that you insulate your own, uh, your own lot on, on, on in this shelf. Uh, so you're independent from your fellow self-builders. Um, if he falls, he, she falls off the ladder, um, you can still continue with your construction site. Um, structural grid, uh, according to the course for, um, for uh, um, fresh water, heating, electricity, and sewage, a super um, minimized circulation shaft, but um, we proposed 
a space system based on this is this is um, this is Schloss Benrath in Düsseldorf, um, Rococo, uh, perfect enfilade system. You know there are no corridors. One build, one room leads into the other, and this was our proposal for the settlers um, of that building that you would live corridor free and be able to interpret each room the way you would like it. Um, so this is one setup, right? This this can be a parent's uh, bedroom, but this could also be the living room because the cores uh, were so smartly distributed that um, you could switch. Um, there you can actually see it up there. Um, we did design the floor plans together with the settlers before they bought, respectively rented their place. So they were renting settlers and real, real estate owning settlers. And if you do a participatory project, don't expect your subjects to follow your rules because um, they made sketches. Um, and some of them were very nasty, but most of them were, interestingly enough, the opposite of what we thought. Uh, like super huge uh, living room, tiny uh, rooms in the north, um, but you have to accept that in a participatory project. And the good thing is here, I mean, all the walls are, in, are not load bearing. So you, can, you could tear them out again if you'd like. Um, but um, the most beautiful moment certainly was this one. <laughs> Pure art. Um, uh, and then in the winter of 2012, minus 15 degrees, Mr. Burmeister on his construction site. You saw him earlier in the consultations. And we produced a manual on how to build a house yourself. 180 pages. Um, you can download this from our internet uh, site. Um, a lot of expectations that were not fulfilled. People hate to um, um, install windows because they're afraid that they're not sealed which also is true. It's not that easy. Um, we let them do the plumbing and everything was then inspected by a professional. So this is purely legal German construction. Um, exterior wall uh, would, have, would have been too expensive. We, the whole thing. So this is, this is, this is a super light um, um, Xella uh, concrete blocks. Um, our rendering um, in the competition. Um, that year we uh, went to Sicily on winter vac vacations and there's, uh, uh, it's a heaven. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Um, yes, Svartlamon, Trondheim. Um, I visited, uh, that was long after we finished this, this project. Uh, I visited this, um, uh, it's not an informal settlement, it's actually um, supported by the city municipality. Beautiful, when you ever get to um, Trondheim, right next to the uh, um, subway, uh, uh, sub submarine uh, shelter, you will find Swatlamon. Um, yeah, I can fast forward. Oh, yeah, you want to see how the building looks finished. Um, Last project, very close, uh, very, very short. Competition for the Hafen City in Hamburg. It's a cooperative. Um, so uh, the people especially asked for an elastic um, adaptive uh, floor plans because they wanted to shrink and grow in their life uh, cycle, you know, form a family, have children's rooms then reduce, and um, so we, uh, um, we develop these diagrams on how uh, the units, so you have like a core unit, and you have um, flexible, um, um, let's say, uh, Schalträume. Um, uh, ah, can't translate it. It's, uh, uh, so flexible rooms that you can add or subtract from your unit. 
Of course, this needs some sort of uh, uh, negotiation which within the cooperative, and it creates a multitude of possibilities of how to um, divide these, uh, this floor pattern, uh, pattern uh, into small units, large units, um, shared spaces that uh, are communal spaces, and um, unfortunately we did not win this competition, <laughs> but do we have another two minutes? <laughs> yeah, this one we did win. And um, we, we are about to uh, finish the project, and it's in Bavaria. Um, it's an offspin of the uh, Munich Cooperative Großstadt uh, Cooperative. Um, and it's a group of elderlies that formed a cooperative to say, we, 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 we the, our uh, detached individual houses are much too big for us, we want to move together, walking distance to the town center. And um, so it was a site uh, with a slope and by coincidence, this slope is uh, the 6% of the barrier-free ramp that you need in Germany for um, elderly housing. So we copied that slope onto the entire building, and so it's stepped according to the 6%. And the access gallery is a very social space um, because everyone, uh, it's, it's uh, south-facing, uh, winter gardens facing this access gallery. So there is a moment of together in that building and the, f the further you go into the, the units, you find privacy, but to the front, um, there's, there's uh, companionship. Uh, porches in the south of America, our version of these porch winter garden spaces, um, Yes, it's a, it's a kind of um, threshold and, 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 and um, membrane between the private and the public. Um, the floor plans are very easy. They, uh, I mean, this is load-bearing, this is not load-bearing, and there's this um, cross, uh, cross partition of the apartment, and they come in different lengths, so this is the possibilities you have within this framework. And um, of course, since there's different depths, you have a multitude, there's not a single apartment uh, like the other. Um, on top of that, there's a communal uh, living uh, dining room with a fireplace. Uh, this is actually the janitor or the superintendent and there is a shed, uh, because they all have their private cars now, so they wanted lots of parking space, and we said, we know in a matter of a year or so, you will sell your car, because you don't need it. And you can share a car for the, with the cooperative, and then the, um, the shed will turn into a communal space, uh, or rendering, um, and this is reality. Um, last week, um, and this is where we got the inspiration from because we went with students to Mexico and stayed on this hacienda and they had a living room shed <coughs> TV space. It was fantastic. Um, so this is what we hope will happen to the car uh, parking shed. Um, rendering. Three weeks ago, last week, last image. Thank you. Thanks very much. So,